Okay, so this is section 3.6, and it's over Cauchy-Euler equations, okay? So we've already covered in 3.3 and in 3.4, I'm sorry, 3.5. We skipped over 3.4, that was nonsense, okay? So in 3.3 and 3.5, the kinds of equations we learned how to do were the ones that had constant coefficients. That's the kinds we learned, okay? And we learned how to do it whether it was homogeneous, equal to zero, or non-homogeneous, equal to some function, okay? Now we're starting to open the door for things other than just constant coefficients, okay? And the next step besides constant coefficients is if you have um, x, the variable x, okay, where the um, exponents are of a certain manner. Eventually, we might, I don't even know that we do that in this class because this is not like the full on DE, and I think y'all actually don't do it until DE2. But right now, your exponents have to match a particular pattern. Eventually, if you go further into DE, you can, it doesn't even matter what the exponent on x is, there's a technique to do that too, okay? But for now, the Cauchy Euler equations are specific. Normally, we're just going to see this half, okay? But they do exist, right? You can go to higher derivatives, like the fifth derivative or the sixth derivative. And the key thing is, is that the exponent of x has to match the number of derivative you're taking, okay? So now, remember, we're only going up to y double prime, right? So that means that the x squared for y double prime, x for y prime, and then just a constant for y, okay? So that's what a Euler, Cauchy Euler equation is. It's just that the x exponent has to match the prime. Okay? If it doesn't, it may be possible for you to manipulate it so that it is so. Um, and if that's the case, then go on ahead. But um, if not, then you'd have to have a whole other technique. And we're not even going to get to those problems. So you won't see them. Okay? Ours are either going to be in this this form or we're going to be able to manipulate it to make it into this form okay now the only thing difference is is here you have homogeneous right and here you have non-homogeneous okay if it's non-homogeneous the method to solve the homogeneous is very similar to the method that we solved in 3.3 okay therefore consequently the non-homogeneous method is going to be very similar to what we did in 3.5 but when we did the method in 3.5, as soon as we had to do w1 and w2, we were plugging in 0 and f of x, right? And that's why I made this note here. Be careful, because you have to have y double prime by itself before you can figure out what f of x is that you're going to use in the w part, okay? So we'll get to the examples, of course. There's going to be like one or two of them on that. But I just want you to make sure you have to have it in this form to do what you're going to do at the beginning, but then you have to have it in this form if you want to identify what the F is, okay? So it's a little bit of playing with the forms. Now, let me give you the strategy. So the strategy is to let Y equal X to the M. And then you can totally find Y prime, no biggie, using power rule, and you can even find um, y double prime using again the power rule and the constant multiplier so it's not too bad to find the derivatives here if you just let y equal x to the m if you're doing that that means your solutions are probably going to look like x to the something right so then depending on what case you get these are what your formulas are going to be so for the Cauchy Euler for stuff you have totally different formulas than you did for the constant coefficients, okay? So when you've got those x's in the front, it's completely different rules. So notice that if I have two distinct roots, it's c1 times x to whatever that first root is, plus c2 times x to whatever that second solution is. And the solutions being to the auxiliary equation, okay? I'll show you how it sets up and how it works out in a second. Then repeated roots, you're going to do the same thing, except notice this time you're not putting in an extra factor of x, right? Like you did in the other th the other rules. Now you're putting an extra factor of ln x. 
So it's different from the other repeated formula. And then for complex roots, um, you were using e to the alpha x, now you're just using x to the alpha. Okay? So they are completely different formulas. You are going to be given both sets of formulas on the test. So you'll have them on the test itself. All it's going to say is constant coefficient formulas and Cauchy Euler formulas. That's how it's going to be labeled. Okay? So you're going to need, well, the constant coefficient, that one's kind of self explanatory, right? But you'll need to know what a Cauchy Euler needs to look like before you can before you can use those formulas, right? Okay. So it says, oh, I just mentioned the same thing. They're different from the other ones, okay? So here's the first example. They want me to try this guy. Now remember what the strategy is. It's just let y equal x to the m. That's the strategy. That's where I start, okay? So if I let y equal that, What would x, y prime be? If I apply the power rule to taking derivatives, what will I get for y prime? Mx yes, bring down the power and then decrease the power by one. Right? And y double prime. You still have this constant multiplier, right? But what is the derivative of x to the m minus 1? And if I simplify that, that's just like saying 1 or m times this. And I could even distribute this and get m squared minus m, x to the m minus 2. Now, one of two things can happen. Either you can memorize all three of those, which after doing a few of them, you kind of will just by default because you just keep using the same thing over and over <coughs> and over again or you can derive them the way I did. The book just tells you to memorize. It says y1 equals y prime equals this and y2 equals this. And they don't tell you like where they came from or how they got it. They just, and then they use them throughout the rest. So I'm assuming that they just memorized that and they kept going. But if you don't remember it, you can derive it, right? Just use your power rule to get each prime and you'll get there, okay? I know that y double prime is gonna be m squared minus m times x to the m minus 2, okay? Just because you do it so many times, you eventually just memorize it. But now I'm going to plug everybody in. So I'm going to have x times m squared minus m times x to the m minus 2 plus, and actually I cannot, I am not allowed to do it yet, is my Nakashi Euler equation. Mm -mm. My exponent on x is supposed to match the kind of prime I have. So that means this should be x squared before I can say this is a Cauchy Euler and I can keep going, right? But if I multiply this whole thing by x, like every single term, right? It will become x squared y double prime plus x y prime equal to what zero times x? Still zero, right? Is that a Cauchy Euler equation? It is now. Now my exponent and my prime match. Here my exponent and my prime match as well, right? So now it's a, a Cauchy Euler. And so this is what I should be plugging all these y primes and y double primes in, not the original, okay? So I should be saying x squared times m2 minus m x to the m minus 2 
plus x times y prime, which is this guy, and then equal to zero. Now what happens if you're multiplying things with the same base? What do you do with their exponents? You add them. And so what's going to happen when you add 2 plus m minus 2? Mm -hmm. Basically, that 2 is going to cancel that 2, right? And so you're just going to end up with m. 2 plus m minus 2, right? Those cancel. And you just have m. So then I have m times this, and then over here, the same thing's going to happen. I'm going to have to add this exponent to that, and I'm going to get x to the m by itself. Now, I can factor that x to the m from both of those terms. If I do that, I end up with m squared minus m plus this m over here. So I'm taking the x to the m out, right? And I'm left with m squared minus m plus that m right there, okay? And if I combine my like terms inside the brackets, I'm just gonna have m squared, aren't I? And I can try to use my zero factor property that says one or both of these guys has to be zero, right? In order for me to multiply them and get zero. Well, x to m is never going to be zero unless x itself is zero. Okay? And when x is zero, that's what's called the, um, a trivial solution. So it's not going to give us any answers. Y equal to zero is always an answer for everything. Because if I take the prime and I take the double prime and I multiply it by God knows what, it's all just zero, 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 right? <laughs> so, so y equal to zero is always a solution. It's just a trivial solution. And this one is just going to give me y equals zero. So this one doesn't really help me at all. Okay. So yes, you can set it equal to zero, but that's not going to be your focus. Your focus is to solve the one with the m's. Okay. And here, m is going to equal what? Zero, but how many times? It's repeated twice. Because if I take the square root, don't you get plus or minus square root of zero? Which means you have two answers. Okay? So it's repeated twice. Which means I need to be using this formula here. Okay? With m equal to zero. So that means I'm going to get y equals c1 x to the zero plus c2 x to the zero ln of x. Well, x to the 0 is just what? Anything to the power 0 is what? 1. So this is just c1 plus c2 ln of x. And that's the solution. It's the general solution. So I don't need to go any further with it. It was a homogeneous part. So once you get the formula, you're done. yc is the answer. You don't have to go figure out yp the one with the W's and the U's and all that. Let's try another one. Does this one look like a Cauchy Euler? Does the exponent on X match the kind of prime it is? It does, right? You have X squared and then you have Y double prime, right? And then you have X and you have Y prime and then you have no primes and no X's right? So it does match. It is a Cauchy Euler, which means I have to go with my strategy. Let y equal x to the m. If I do that, y double prime by memory is going to be this. y prime is going to be this. And then y is going to be what we said it was going to be, right? So we end up with this equation. Still homogeneous, so once I figure out what m is and I give you the solution, I'm done. Okay, we don't have to go through that other process. But what happens when I multiply these guys together? What do you get? Mm 
Mm-hmm. And what happens when I multiply these guys together? The other one already has an x to the m, right? So we're going to do the same thing again. Factor out an x to the m. But this time I end up with m squared minus m plus 5m plus 3. Everything without the x to the m, right? And we already said, yes, we could set this equal to 0, but the only time that that's going to equal 0 is if x equals 0. And if x is equal 0, you're basically finding the answer y equals 0 which is a trivial answer. You don't, those are always been the answers, but nobody cares about that one. <laughs> they want the more complex answers, right? So let's not worry about this one. Let's worry about that auxiliary equation. If I combine my M's, I get this equation. So then I can factor that actually, M plus one and M plus three, does that work? Yeah, I think so. So if I get my M's, what are my M's then? Mm -hmm. And these are different from each other, right? So that means I need to use the top formula, which means my Y is going to be C1 X to the negative 1 plus C2 X to the negative 3. And that's it. It was homogeneous. So once I plug in the M's, I'm done. It's the non-homogeneous. It's always the non-homogeneous that are going to be your headaches, okay? But I promise you the integration step in the cauchy eulers is a lot nicer than the constant coefficients. Because the constant coefficients, this part has a bunch of E's in it, doesn't it? And so that's what makes it complicated. But here I'm just have X's with powers. That's nice. I can integrate those. Not a big deal. <laughs> okay. So let's go see, I don't know what the next one looks like. I picked them, but more homogeneous. Probably to hit all the other formulas. Okay, so is this one set up for the Kashi Euler, for the strategy? Is it good to go? We got x squared, double prime. x prime, no x, no primes, right? So it's good. So I'm just going to start, I'm not even going to say let y equal x to the, I'm just going to start plugging everything in, okay? So 25x squared times m squared minus m x to the m minus 2, all of this for y double prime, plus 25x m x to the m minus 1, this for y prime, and then x to the m for y. I mean, and you could do the next step. I kind of skip it most times. I just do. Because I already know that these two are going to be x to the m, and these two are going to be x to the m, and that's already got an x to the m, right? So I just factor the x to the m right away. But what am I left with? I'm left with 25 times m squared minus m, plus 25 times that m, plus what? one good so then let's see what we end up with inside these big brackets we end up with 25 m squared minus 25 m plus 25 m plus one that's not really going to give me any solutions these guys are going to cancel and i get this now, I could do the quadratic formula. I could try to factor it. I don't know that y'all know how to factor things with imaginaries. So the only thing else I can do to get those imaginaries is to uh, just use the square root property. So we'll minus one, then divide by 25. 
then take the square root, so we get plus or minus, and the negative inside the square root is what's going to become the i. And the square root of 1 is 1, and the square root of 25 is 5. So what you end up with here is plus or minus 1 fifth i. Okay? And if that's the case, what is alpha? Because when I get i's, that's complex root, right? And my formula, if you look at it real quick, doesn't have i's in it. It just has alphas and betas. So I need to know what alpha is. What is alpha for this particular problem? Nope. Nope. It's the real part, but isn't it the real part missing? If it's missing, what, is it, what do I use? Zero. And then the beta is the coefficient of i. No sign, because you can't put both, right? So it's just the one fifth. Okay? But alpha is supposed to be the real part of that complex number. And then the beta is supposed to be the imaginary part. Okay? And since I'm missing the real part, normally the real part is in front of the plus or minus. Um, because I'm missing it, we have to use zero. So when I go to use my formula, my answers are going to be x to the alpha, c1, cosine of beta ln x, plus c2, sine of beta ln x. And cosine, or I'm sorry, I don't know why I said cosine. <laughs> x to the 0 is 1, so really I don't even need that coefficient outside the bracket. So you can just write it as the cosine plus the sine. So if you don't see the answer, the x is in the answer, that's why. Because x is 0 is really not even a variable anymore. It's just a constant 1. Okay, we're going to go into the next one. When do I hit non? Okay, there we go. How many non homogeneouses do I have? I have only one non homogeneous. Nice. Let me see how many are in the homework. <laughs> So is example four set up as a Cauchy-Euler equation already? It is. The squares match the primes, right? And I think in your homework you have two, two non-homogeneous. But like I said, they're not anything crazy. And then everything else is homogeneous. Everything else is homogeneous. So I only have two examples, two problems in the homework that are non-homogeneous. So let's see, I'm gonna plug everything in. I got x squared, m squared minus m, x to the m minus two, eight x, m, x to the m minus one, six x to the m equal to zero. If I factor out the x to the m's, even hidden ones, I'm going to get x to the m times m squared minus m plus 8m plus 6. Then I can set each one equal to 0, but really all you're concerned about is this part, right? So I'm going fast because this is just stuff we've already done and I don't want to waste time going over, right, again. So we've got two distinct, well that's nice because that's one formula, right? The first formula. Why did I go over another example? <laughs> that's exactly the same. So we get y equals c1 x to the negative 1 plus c2 x to the negative 6. And that's it. That's all for that one. That one was like super fast. 
eventually you get fast, right? The beginning, they take longer. You gotta explain and everything. But that's how fast, like if this were a problem on the test, that's how fast it should be done, right? It literally took like two minutes, three minutes, right? It doesn't take that long to do these. Okay. This one, now we're getting there. <laughs> There's the non-homogeneous, okay? And we do it just like we did in 3.5. We pretend that it's homogeneous and we figure out this answer, but then this is only half of it, right? That's only YC, and we have to use this part, and we have to use this part to figure out YP, okay? So let's go ahead and go through all of that process. So the fast part we can do, it's already set up. My exponent matches my prime. Exponent matches my prime. No X's, no primes. So if I go in and I plug everything in the way I'm supposed to, and I'm gonna pretend that it's homogeneous, right? This is how you get the YC. So I get m equal to 1, but repeated, okay, time twice. Which formula is that? Oh, that's the one where I tag on an L and an X. So that means that YC is going to be C1, E, not E, X to the power 1, or just X, plus C2, X to the power 1, ln of X. Now, I didn't write my power ones, right, but they're there. I'm plugging m value into both of those exponents. And this helps me because now I know that y1 is just x, but y2 is a little bit more complicated, right? y2 is x ln of x. So let's set up our run scheme. So y1 is x, y2 is this. And we need the derivatives to actually do the determinant. What is the derivative of x? One. Mm -hmm. And then this is a product. So you have to do the product rule. So the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first, which I'm going to clean that up. It's going to be 1 plus ln of x. Right? Won't the x's cancel? And you'll just have 1. And when you multiply anything times 1, it's the same thing. So I'm not going to use this version. I'm going to use the cleaned up version. Okay? When I do the determinant. So we have x times this guy's, which means I have to distribute the x. So I get x plus ln of x. Oops, I lied. I get x plus x ln of x, right? When you distribute the x. Minus when I multiply these guys. x ln of x. So what do you know? All the weird stuff goes away and you just have x, right? I told you these are not, <laughs> they're not that bad. They look crazy, but they're not that bad. Okay, w1. So column 1 is going to get replaced with the 0 and the f of x. So this is important because this is where that little side note that I had mentioned comes into play. This is not ready for me to pick out f of x. In the definition of a Cauchy-Euler equation, it called this g of x. In order for me to make it an f of x, there should be nothing in front of y double prime. So how do I get rid of this then? I would have to divide every single term by the x squared, right? And then it would go away from the y prime. But if I did that, it would become, this would go away. Basically, I'm doing this. 
okay? And I really couldn't care less about what's going to happen over here because that's not what I want, right? All I want to know is what is f of x. And f of x in this case is going to end up being 2 over x once I cancel those x's, okay? That's what I need inside here, down here at the bottom. So my first column is supposed to get replaced with 0 and f of x, which is 2 over x. The second column can stay exactly the way it was. So then when I do my determinant part, 0 times both of these guys is just going to be 0 and 0, minus 2 over x times this guy. What's going to happen to the x's when I multiply those together? Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to end up with 2 and then the ln of x, which means all I have here is negative 2 ln of x. Then w2 is going to be the second row gets replaced with 0 and 2 over x. And the first column is going to stay the same as the original w. So x and 1. And then when I do my determinant, what happens to these x's when I multiply? Same thing, right? They cancel. So I end up with 2. Minus, when I multiply those, I get 0. So I end up with just 2 here. So when I go to set them up, u1 is going to be negative 2 ln of x over x. And u2 is going to be 2 over x. So I'm going to split my paper again so I can do each one, but I'll have them side by side. Now, this one you may not have ever seen before, but you can use um, u substitution. I can write this as ln of x times 1 over x dx. Do you agree or disagree? Is that wrong? I can take denominators out, right? As long as I write them as 1 over that denominator, it's the same. Okay? And notice that isn't this guy the derivative of that guy? So if I wanted, I could say, we'll use z, like Jonathan said. So let z equal ln of x, then dz would be 1 over x dx. And I have all of those pieces there. So I end up with negative 2 z dz. And now it's just the power rule. So I get z squared over 2, which means negative z squared, because the 2's will cancel. And then go back and plug in what z was. So I get negative ln of x squared. It looks weird, but that's what it is. You cannot use your um, log properties here. Because it's not log of x squared, it's the whole entire log of x squared. Okay? So you can't bring the 2 down to the front. You can't do it. Those log properties only apply when your argument has a power, not when the whole log has a power. Okay? Let's try this one. This one's a lot nicer, too. This one's actually nicer than the other one. So take out the 2, and what's the integral of 1 over x dx? We've seen that one already today. It's just ln, right? So that one was a lot shorter because we already have the answer. Now, if you wanted to, you could bring this here, but keep in mind that guy's not the same as this guy, right? We just said that. This has the argument squared. This has the entire log squared, okay? So they are not the same. 
So yp is going to be u1 times y1. What the heck was y1? Oh, up here. <laughs> y1 was just x. Plus u2 times y2, and y2 was this. So I think I'm going to leave it the other way because I actually do have like terms here. So instead of writing ln of x squared, I'm going to leave it the way it was as 2 ln x. Because then don't you notice you have an ln of x times another ln of x and that's the ln of x squared, right? And that would help me to have a common, a like term. So here I'm going to have 2x and then ln of x squared. And so the ln of x squared matches and the x matches, right? So they are completely like terms. So how many do I end up with if I have negative one of these things and then a positive two of these things? A positive one of those things. So I just have x ln of x squared. So that's why p. And then if I want the entire answer, I have to do yc plus yp, which means the whole answer is c1x plus c2x ln of x, and then plus what I just got right now. And are these like terms? Any of those like terms? If they are, you only have to write the c, right? You don't have to write the other term. But this has a square and that one doesn't, right? So these two are not like terms. So you can't put them together. This is your final, final answer. Okay? So the integrating part is not as bad as the constant coefficient stuff. Um, but just remembering the whole process is going to be the challenge, okay? Remembering the w and the w1 and the w2 and then how to get u1 and how to get u2. And then to remember to go multiply them by y1 and y2, right? That Those are the things that you're going to have to memorize. And I always tell people there's nothing wrong with the memory dump. So sometimes as the teacher's handing out the test, I'm like going over my stuff trying to memorize it. And then as soon as they give me the test, I just like write it all down. So that way you can have it there and you don't have to worry about it. And I literally take it to the last second. Like... Okay, give me my test. <laughs> and then I start scribbling it. Okay. So let's see. We have one more. What's different about this guy? Is it a long one or is it a short one? Without this, is it a long one or a short one? Uh -huh, because it's equal to zero, right? So I don't have to do all the W's and all of that stuff, right? But I do have an extra part, right? Because after I'm done, I still have to do the initial conditions. But I promise you, you can take... The only one that's going to suck is this one, if you get that as the answer, because you have to take the derivative of that, right? <laughs> the other ones are not so bad, but that one is really awful. Okay. So let's see, this one's already got the square and the double prime and the x and the prime and the no x's and no primes. So I'm just gonna go right in and plug in the parts for the primes and the y. And then I'm gonna take all the x of the m's out, even the hidden ones and I get m squared minus m minus 3m plus 4. And so I'm not going to worry about setting that one equal to 0, right? It just gives me the trivial solution, y equals 0. Nobody cares about that answer that we know is the answer for everything. We just want to know about this one. So I think I can do this one positive and negative. Okay, good. So I get m equals 2, but repeated, right? 
which means I end up with y equal to c1 x squared plus c2 x squared with the extra factor of the ln of x. Now the rest of it's just your college algebra stuff, right? Well, you have to use a little bit of calculus, right? Because in order for me to plug these numbers in, I have to have y prime, don't I? So use a little bit of calculus first, and then you can use your algebra, right? So y prime, here it's nice. It's 2c1 x to the 1. Here, not so nice. I have to do the product rule. So the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. So I actually end up with 2c1x plus c2x, because one of these guys cancels, plus 2c2x ln of x. When I multiply that and I distribute the c2 over there. So now we can do our system. So I should be getting 5 for y when I plug in 1 for x. And then for y prime, I should be getting 3 when I plug in 1 for x. Oops. What is the ln of 1? It's just 0. So that means that this whole entire term is 0, right? Because I'm multiplying by 0. That also means that this whole entire term is going to be 0 because it's a bunch of stuff multiplied by 0. So really, I'm only solving this system. If I clean it up with all the multiplication and then the ln of 1 going to 0, that's what I end up with. And I don't need to use elimination method because the top equation already has somebody eliminated, right? So you just take that and go plug it in and figure out what C2 is. So I'm going to minus 10 on both sides. I get negative 7 equals C2. So that means my final answer is 5 for C1, oops, and negative 7 for C2. So I'm just plugging the C1 here and the C2 there. homework, right? I feel like I don't want homework, but you need it. <laughs> so you can practice these things. So one, two, four, five, seven, eight. These are going to be all of your, um, two, three, four, five, six. That should be good. Trying to make sure I get some imaginaries in there. I think that's good. Yeah. So these are going to be all the homogeneous ones. Then you have two that are non-homogeneous, but I promise they're not as bad as the stuff in 3.5. The whole process sucks, I know, but <laughs> it's long. But when you get to the integrating part, it's not as complicated. Okay. That's what I mean by they're not as bad. <laughs> Um, and then finally the ones like this one with the initial condition, that's going to be 25, 
26 and 28. And those are all homogeneous. So they're not the long ones. And then on top of that, you got to do the, the system of equations. It's just like this one. Solve it like a homogeneous and then do the systems of equations. Okay. Okay. Um, I do have the review. I need to manipulate it because I want to put the formulas in there. So once I type all that up today, I'll put it online when I put this lecture online. Um, so you'll have the review. So if you want to look at it between now and on class on Thursday, you can. Um, but we are going to go over it on Thursday so you can see what it looks like. Okay. And what everything should, how everything should play out. Test is not till Tuesday. So a week from today. So if you're still needing time for homework and all that, that's what we're going to do on Thursday. If we finish the whole review, I don't know that I'll finish it early, but if I do finish it early, then um, we'll use the rest of the time to work on homework or ask questions about the homework. So if you're stuck on a particular couple of them, you can ask. Okay. But that's it. We finished how many minutes early? Like 10, 12, 12 minutes early? That's not bad. 14. <laughs> 14 minutes early, that's good.